Ben, it is always a pleasure sitting down with you. Uh, these conversations are stimulating and weird as they should be. Uh, but I also knew there are a lot of new things going on with SingularityNet. So here at AIBC in Dubai, March 2022, what are the latest news that you can share? There's an awful lot going on in the SingularityNet universe and it really defies a concise description, but I, I mean at the, at the foundational platform level, we're, we're proceeding rapidly now with the port of Singularity Net platform from Ethereum to Cardano, which there will be multiple stages, but the, the token converter for the AGIX token from the Ethereum to Cardano version and, and back, both versions will coexist. The converter will be launched on April 18th, so we finally have a, a reasonably hard date for that. And then a little while after that, we'll have staking of the AGI ADA tokens and then the full port of SingularityNet marketplace on, onto Cardano. So that's, that's sort of in the plumbing of the network, but is, is still, still valuable and, and, and important. And th then various projects that we're building on top of SingularityNet platform are, are, are progressing and we could talk about a whole, whole bunch of these. No, no, of course, but ju just to stay at the, at the Cardano uh, ADA uh, level for the moment, um, for those who are following us, uh, Cardano is a very uh, ponderate platform. They don't hurry things up. They take time to, to build things. So the, the, the smart contract layer running on Cardano needed a certain level of development before SingularityNet could uh, uh, run on it. Well, yeah, I mean, obviously Ethereum had smart contracts in 2017, which is why we launched SingularityNet on Ethereum, and Cardano's Plutus smart contract language is it's far superior to Ethereum's solidity from a technical perspective. It's basically a, a utilization of the Haskell functional programming language. But, I mean, it took, it took a while for Plutus to be released and, and not, now, now, now it's there. So we've, we've written the converter as a Plutus smart contract and we're working on the, the marketplace as a collection of Plutus smart contracts. Does this mean that those people who are enthusiastic about the potential of SingularityNet, its concept and its marketplace, need to adopt the kind of functional language mentality as opposed to the object-oriented mentality? No, the, the Singularity Net platform was not primarily coded in Solidity, right? So there's, there's Golang, there, there's Python, there's a bunch of more conventional programming language in there. And that doesn't, that doesn't need to and won't change in, in the port to Cardano. So, I mean, AI agents running on Singularity Net can be written in Python, Java, C++, whatever, whatever language you want. And the the blockchain-based portion uh, uh, of singularity that, that, that's just used for coordination of, of the agents, right? So there is a, a good degree of isolation uh, there, where there the is. economic incentives are now on There is, but, th but this actually leads on to another interesting topic. So the, the talk I just gave now at the AIBC conference, together with my, my longtime friend Tufi Saliba, was about a project called HyperCycle. And Hypercycle, currently in an early stage of development, but it's a, it's a custom Cardano sidechain, which is customized just to, to provide massively more scalable and, and efficient blockchain-based services for, for AI, both narrow AI and, and, and AGI. And it's based on putting together Tufi and Dan Tolliver's work on the Tota platform with proof of reputation from, singular, from SingularityNet using Cardano's Hydra protocol to allow us to run Plutus smart contracts on HyperCycle. Now, one of the design goals of HyperCycle is to let you put more and more of the AI actually on chain, on, on, on the blockchain. So the way that we use SingularityNet now, a SingularityNet AI agent is usually a pretty chunky thing, right? So you have, you have a Docker container or an LXC container. It, it runs an AI agent and as a sort of sidecar proxy to that, it runs some singularity net code that lets an AI agent coordinate with other parts of singularity net. And that's, 
That's fine, that's good, that way of doing things probably should always be there. It would also be interesting to make the use of blockchain more, more granular, so that more of the finer-grained AI operations and AI data structures could be, be running on, on, on the blockchain. I mean, th that would let you decentralize things further down, right? So say if you have, say, a genetic algorithm as one example, where you have a population of candidate solutions to some AI problem, right now you would just put that whole evolving population in one AI agent, right? which has then that whole population interacts as a whole with SingularityNet. It would be nice if each evolving entity in the genetic algorithm could be an entity on the blockchain so that mutation and crossover in the GA population were all on-chain actions, right? And that would let you have an evolving population where different population elements were owned, owned by different people, right? And getting, and getting credit on the blockchain. So to be able to use the blockchain at the more granular level, you need something like HyperCycle, which is just massively more efficient and low cost and designed just for AI. Now, once we go there, then you actually would want to rewrite the, the AI code in a different way to exploit HyperCycle. But that's sort of the next step, right? Step one is get from Ethereum onto Cardano. Step two will be get from Cardano onto HyperCycle, which is our own custom Cardano sidechain. When you get to the hypercycle level, then you'll have the option, like, do I want to rewrite my AI code to use blockchain all the way down and, and leverage hypercycle? Sometimes that will be the best thing to do. Sometimes it won't be. It interests me a lot, right? So with, with our OpenCog Hyperon AGI toolkit, we're, we're rewriting the OpenCog AGI framework. We're rewriting it completely into a new version called Hyperon. And one of the design goals there is we're rewriting it so it will, it will be natural to run Hyperon on, on HyperCycle and, and make it really, you know, blockchainized at the, at the more ato atomic level. So it's a hy hyper all the way down. We're, we're very hyper. At that's right. That, that's right. right. And, and, and this, of course, serves the long-term goal of, of AGI uh, development. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the goal, as always, with Singularity is beneficial, decentralized, democratic, artificial general intelligence, because this is the best way to propel humanity toward a beneficial technological singularity and create super intelligence and all that good stuff that we've been talking about for uh, seems like seems like decades now yes. right and yes. that, that remains the goal but there's a whole complex tech stack required to get there right so we can look at singularity net as a sort of ai multi-agent system is sort of in the middle of the tech stack hypercycle cardano and so forth are below it opencog hyperon is something designed to run on singularity net on hypercycle and then you have the various vertical market specific projects and i gave a talk on one of these at this aibc event here in dubai as well which was a sophiaverse which is a a metaverse designed to leverage singularity net ai and hansen robotics character ai technology as well which will allow people to interact with avatar versions of the Sophia robot and avatar versions of other character AIs and you know work with these to, to build stuff to create NFTs to engage in, 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 ga in gameplay in, in this uh, metaverse but that's that's one among a host of vertical market specific projects I mean another for example is Reju Rejuve which leverages singular AI for longevity biology another transhumanist topic you and I have been talking about forever. And, and, and these are, I think, very useful because they show the extended community that while keeping an eye in the long term, on the long-term mission, Singularity Net is also practical in creating projects that uh, uh, give birth to, to, to value created yeah, today. Yeah, that, so there, there's, a, there's a bit of subtlety to the relation between narrow AI and AGI. I mean, I, I don't believe you're going to get to AGI just by creating a bunch of narrow AIs and having them sort of interoperate. And, and, and in this, uh, yeah. uh, you, well, you uh, uh, differ from I, some, I, some I, current I, AI. I differ AI. from some folks. Yeah. On the other hand, if you look at, say, Google DeepMind, I mean, Shane Legg has a team working just on AGI R&D, along with their many teams working, working on narrow AI. So I would say DeepMind appears to think similar to me in this regard, that the constellation of narrow AIs 
contrib will contribute to the emergence of AGI, but yet you also want some specific focus on the general, general intelligence and abstract reasoning and learning aspect. Now, Shane at DeepMind and I probably differ on exactly what algorithms and, and approaches we think are going to lead to AGI, but I think we both agree that narrow AI has a lot to contribute to the emergence of AGI, but you also are going to need some focused work just on on, on AGI, right? So what we're doing in Rejuve, what we're doing in the, in the Sophiaverse, in, in Singularity DAO with AI for Decentralized Finance, I mean, all these things are vertical market specific, but they're all going to contribute something to the multi-agent systems that will help guide the emergence of AGI. But you also need stuff like OpenCog Hyperarm, which is focused just on the, the algorithms of general intelligence. And it's by connecting these pieces together in a platform like SingularityNet that, that AGI is going to crystallize. Uh, tell me about uh, deep funding and how it will further accelerate the creation of these vertical projects. Absolutely. And I touched on this in the, the first of the three talks I gave here at the AIB, AIBC conference, which is focused on SingularityNet as, as, as a whole. So that you know, the intention from the beginning was always to make SingularityNet really a decentralized autonomous organization and a community-driven project. Now, making that happen has required a bunch of work and a bunch of, of, of focus because the, the more natural way to drive progress forward in the tech project, I mean, the way that we're all used to from running tech companies, is you, you hire people, you, you, you have them build stuff, and the, there's a lot of focus you can get from that, right? But we, we know that to really achieve our goals of beneficial decentralized general intelligence, we need it to be more of a decentralized community effort. So one step there was baked into the Singularity Net Phase 2 initiative that the community, uh, community approved a year ago, which is of the stream of AGI ADA tokens that, that, that's been newly minted as part of phase two, 30% of these newly minted AGI ADA tokens go not to the Singularity Net Foundation, which is getting 50% of these to, to, to use with development of the, of the network under its direction, but 30% of the newly minted tokens are going into a project called Deep Funding or Decentralized Ecosystem Project Funding. And the way deep funding works is community members propose projects and then community members vote on which, on which projects are, are, are funded. So 30% of these newly minted tokens, which in the end will be 15% of, of all, all AGI tokens out there, are directed by community vote toward community projects, right? And I think this is similar in a way to Cardano's Catalyst program, which has been an inspiration, but we're operating it in a somewhat somewhat different way as, as suited for the different nature of what we're doing, because Cardano was sort of all vertical markets, and we're, we're, we're all vertical markets, but in, in, in an AI-focused in AI way, right? So the, the first round of deep funding, we are now uh, beginning with the process there, so we're, we're soliciting proposals from the from the community now, the window is open. The window has been open for proposals. Proposals are now be now being reviewed, and before long, there, there's going to be a vote. And this first round will involve roughly a million U.S. dollars equivalent in AGI ADA tokens to be given out to community members as as grants for their projects. And we've seen a bunch of the proposals now. There's a lot. There's a lot of really cool stuff there, actually. So I'm. I'm very psyched about that, and you know, I, I think uh, one of the challenges we faced in SingularityNet so far is just getting traction started on the platform, right? I mean, there's, there's cool stuff built on SingularityNet platform now. You can see it in the marketplace at singularitynet.io, but I mean, we need a lot more traction to get, to get where we need to go. The port to Cardano can help with that just because it decreases the decreases the cost and increases the speed of, of actually using the infrastructure and the, the insane gas these on Ethereum have been one major problem in getting traction. But I think uh, giving grant money to incentivize developers to put stuff on the platform, of course that, yeah. of course that can also help. Um, 
You mentioned uh, the objective, which is part of uh, the uh, mission of Singularity Net, of decentralizing AGI, and as a consequence, uh, part of that path uh, to uh, decentralize itself. Uh, a very pragmatic approach where, uh, rather than being born as a DAO, it necessarily has been born as a centralized organization, and now, with my other hat as chairman of the Supervisory Council, we are um, studying uh, an initiative of uh, progressive decentralization. Uh, so this progressive decentralization is, uh, of course, delicate and important in terms of how to avoid mistakes we know other DAOs have already made, how to take advantage of the nature yeah, it's, it's of... A very, it's a very tricky thing, right? So, and that, to be honest, in my heart, I would have rather proceeded faster with progressive decentralization than, than what has, has happened. But I mean, life, life intervened and the crypto markets have been crazy and it's, it's been challenging just to keep the project moving, moving forward by, by, by hook or by crook. Uh, we are no all survivors. Yeah, no matter how centralized or, or decentralized, just to keep, things, yeah. to keep things going, right? So, I mean, to... To really make Singularity Net what it's supposed to be, I mean, the foundation that I'm leading now should be playing less of a, of a centralized role. And so, I mean, unlike a typical startup company, a big aspect of the mission of Singularity Net Foundation is to decrease its own importance, right? I mean, a big aspect of my job as, to CEO, as CEO of Singularity Net Foundation is to make my own job less powerful and, and, and less, less important, which appeals to me greatly because then I can go back to doing, doing AGI research and, and, and writing books instead of running a company, right? So, I mean, I, I think we need, we need to be pioneering new forms of, of governance. And this is, is just, it's very challenging. It, it hasn't been done before in human history, right? I mean, while a centralized software project has its downsides, it also has its upsides. I mean, all the amazing software projects that we use today were, were, were built that way, right? And op open source community, say Linux, for example, gives valuable guidance on what to do. On the other hand, you know, operating systems are, are special in, the, in their really broad-based nature. And so, so something like an AI marketplace you know, it, it's, more, it's more focused, it, 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 it's more specialized, and has, has different, different characteristics than Linux. So I think the, the open source community can teach us a lot. What we're doing is, is different in its specialized focus. It's also different in that there's an economic aspect to it, right? There, there's a tokenomic aspect. So we can learn from the open source community, we can learn from existing DAOs and what they've done right and wrong, but we're gonna, in the end, have to invent a whole bunch of new mechanisms to make, make decentralized governance work for Singularity Net. And this, this is going to be a multi-year quest, but I mean, Singularity Net's been around since late 2017, right? So I think if, if over the next few years we can take some meaningful, substantial steps toward rolling out decentralized governance, this can be very, very important. I mean, one aspect to this, but not necessarily the most important aspect, has to do with, with voting, right? I mean, we need, we need to get beyond one token, one vote, which just lets token whales dominate things. Yet one, one person, one vote also has, has downsides. I mean, one thing you need to master, you know, decentralized, secure K, KYC. But a, a, apart from that, it's not clear which people should have the most input into which aspects of, of what Singularity Net is doing. And I think the, the rollout and advancement of Singularity Net's reputation system should play a role in determining, you know, which people who have reputation and which dimensions get the most say in, in, in which aspects. So that's one piece of it. But then there's another piece, which is just more, more nitty gritty of like deciding what tasks Need, need, need to be done and, and who, needs, who, who needs to do them, right? And we will probably end up with something somewhere in between the way Singularity Net Foundation runs now 
and the way that say something like the, the Linux Linux community works, and you we're looking at developing sort of decentralized versions of Upwork or something, yeah. which, which, which allow tokenomics to be integrated with task allocation. And there's just there's a lot of cool stuff to be thought about and and and, and worked out. But I think it's 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 very important both for both for growth of the community and the network, and for realizing the the democratic and, and, and decentralized aspirations. Uh, I uh, believe that uh, uh, DAOs um, are one of the most important new superstructures that we must embrace, given how clear uh, the limits uh, in the ability of nation states to tackling our current problems are, whether it is uh, climate change, whether it is pandemics, whether it is uh, international uh, security, uh, uh, there are now uh, problems that, that humanity uh, as a whole uh, needs to address and we don't have the tools. I am looking forward yeah. to work together with the AIs and the AGIs to do that. Too. Limitations of companies also, which you look at, right? So if, Correct. if you look at, look at the growth course of a startup company, when it's small, Things are very agile. You can you can move very fast. I mean, the CEO talks to every developer or every social media intern, right? And startup can pivot on a, on a dime, can develop something new to respond to a customer need. As a company gets larger, it almost inevitably becomes a bureaucracy, right? Like I mean, I've, I I first visited Google, I think, in the year two thousand, right? And that was pretty small. It was like what, 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 one, one office. Everyone knew Larry and Sergey, and they were heavily involved in algorithm development and the website and every, every single thing, right? They'd already been around a few years by then, I guess. It was, it was very, very agile. And I mean, Google now is a great company in many ways, but I mean, it's very much, it's very much a bureaucracy, right? And the ability to innovate goes down. They've already reached the level where many of their big innovations, say Google Maps is a big innovation, but that was based on buying something and then, yeah. and then customizing it, right? So, I mean, every company follows that trajectory and even a company like Google, where they tried really, really, really hard to resist that, you just can't help it when you become a certain size. You want to become that size because it means you're successful. You can deploy more resources in the interest of your mission. But when you become that size, how do you not become a bureaucracy, right? And the, the, the DAO could provide a solution to that. It, the, the, the DAO has potential to allow a technology project to ascend to a size where it's commanding a large amount of resources and remain agile and not, not bureaucratic. It doesn't automatically guarantee that, though. I mean, the DAO could be more pathological than the... Unless than, we keep it on the right trajectory. In the end, you, ne you need a federation of DAOs, right? Which is a, you need a decentralized network of decentralized networks on the governance level as well as on, as well as on the software level, right? And so that's, that's, what we need to, that's what we need to pioneer in order, in order to get a, a beneficial technological singularity. And Elon Musk uh, talks about uh, their need in terms of both Tesla and SpaceX uh, to not only keep innovating, but to increase the rate of innovation. And I have been uh, promoting a, a, a view I call the paradigm of jolting technologies, where you talk about the third uh, uh, derivative, uh, the uh, ability of uh, coordinating uh, and, and arriving to consensus of how to apply technologies that produces actually an increasing uh, rate of innovation. Uh, in, in AI, this uh, has been documented by both uh, OpenAI uh, that uh, since 2008 uh, talks about uh, the power of AI doubling every four months rather than uh, uh, going with Moore's Law. Uh, the NVIDIA uh, now, uh, in the words of their CEO, talks about the power of AI doubling every two months. So from two years to four months to two months, we see the rate uh, of uh, innovation. I mean, I would say within certain narrow areas that may be true. I think the way I look at the, the development of AI has in recent decades involved very rapid progress in particular 
aspect. So say computer vision, when you had AlexNet in what, 2014 or something, from a few years after that, you saw this hyper exponential development in computer vision. NLP from Google developing the, the, the BERT system in, in 2018, I mean, you saw this hyper exponential advancement in, in, in natural language processing. And so in those areas, you have what OpenAI guys and NVIDIA have, have seen. If you're talking about general intelligence, not at all. We, we've, we've, we've not really seen that. My, no, nor in, say, medical AI or financial AI. You haven't seen that hyper-exponential growth. You've seen exponential growth, but you, you haven't seen this yeah. increase in the expo. Now, if my hypothesis is in AGI, you're going to see a similar pattern of, say, two to four years of insanely fast hyper-exponential growth. I think that the reason for this, say, two to four-year arc, like we saw in Vision and in language processing is just the rate of change of human information propagation. Like people are downloading each other's code, they're modifying, they're reading and writing papers. And you know, even if the, the ideas are poised to explode exponentially, there's still human beings who have to sleep and, and eat and fly around, right? And, and, and that is yeah. the very nature with, uh, with exponentials. We are accustomed to the initial phase when it is underwhelming. Yeah. A hyper exponential is even flatter at the initial yeah, that's right. phase, right? Yeah. So uh, you, most of the people don't realize, but you are already on the curve that is poised to sure. explode. So my, my hope, of course, is that OpenCog Hyperon, running on SingularityNet net on HyperCycle, will do what AlexNet did for Vision and what BERT did for NLP, and will then trigger this few years of hyper-exponential, super rapid growth in, in AGI. Which, which then would be what, what triggers the, the beneficial singularity, right? And we would be, in that case, so let, let, let's say two years from now we, we trigger that. That would be uh, 2024, we, we trigger this growth period. A few years of this growth period leads to singularity. Then we're getting a singularity in 2027. We're, we're beating Kurzweil's 2029 by a couple of years. That's right, because yeah. he has been updating uh, the book. Uh, the singularity is nearer. Yeah, yeah, I've, uh, I've, I've, I've read the manuscript. You probably <laughs> so, have as well. So, so. So. <laughs> I mean, what was interesting to me reading the manuscript of the singularity is, is nearer is you know, Ray does a very, he does a very good job with, with data, as, as, as always, and sort of substantiating how much better the world has, has gotten in terms of human well-being, substantiating the progress of, of AI, at, at, you know, obsoleting various categories of human jobs, and advancing in, in computer vision, NLP, speech-to-text. On the other hand, it's a lot less shocking than the original book was, right? Be, be, well, for you and me, because uh, I, our I, I think, adaptability has I think has to been the world at out. large, because now the idea that the singularity is coming is quite widely accepted within the segment of the world that's paying attention to advanced technology. Like in, in 2005, it was not nearly so widely accepted. That was around the beginning of the singularity summits, right? I'd say now, now the notion that the singularity may be coming like makes sense to almost everyone in in in, in the tech industry so people are just a lot a lot a lot harder to a lot harder to shock with this sort of thing now which is is good it means that ray has succeeded with his first book and with his uh proselytization over the years i mean along with all the rest of us who have been been tirelessly preaching these ideas to the world right? Ben, it's always wonderful to sit down and, and have these conversations with you. And I'm looking forward to the next one. In the meantime, have a great uh, continuation of the show. We will. Th thanks, David. Yeah.